Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Space Snacks. Today's guest is Anu Rajendran. Hi, Anu. How are you doing? Hi, Sian. How are you? I'm doing good. You're down under in Australia, in Melbourne. That's right. I'm just a little south of Melbourne in Geelong, but we'll, we'll, we'll call it Melbourne. <laughs> I love it because I'm still trained to, to, to pronounce it like an Australian, Melbourne, and you're like Melbourne. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Uh, and so um, welcome to Space Snacks. It's great to have you on. Thank you for having me. And I wanted to do, to just give you a moment to tell our audience a little bit about you and your background. Okay, fantastic. So a little bit about, about my background is that my background is in industrial design and engineering, and I work with human factors primarily. After I finished university, I went on to work for a few companies where I worked with augmented realities, virtual reality technology, artificial intelligence, and designing human factors around how can we best uh, create technology for humans and how can we assist them in the things that they do every day so that's where my speciality lies and I'm really passionate about it I'm really you know into making technology accessible and intuitive and natural and inclusive as well oh that that's so great now did you always I mean that's a relatively emerging technology that whole idea so when you were a kid um, what were you thinking? Were you like, ah, I like, I like engineering. I like, you know, robots, um, yeah. video games. When I was growing up, I had a very little idea of what I wanted to do. It wasn't until I was actually started off in engineering and I was doing this subject called um, design innovation and we had to create an automatic pet feeder. And I was just so into this, like how do I make the best automatic pet feeder ever? And that's kind of where my interest took flight into how, how can we make technology better? How can we like really propel it into the future? Like where we've got a habitat that like speaks to us and you know, we can talk back to it. And you know, it knows me when I walk through the house, like it can alert the police if a burglar is breaking in, like just making a very autonomous and using technology to assist us and not um, uh, go, go beyond like our privacy and all that kind of stuff. And how do we manage that sort of stuff as well? Uh, I, you know, I love that. And of course, it's so applicable to space and space exploration and thinking about, um, you know, how do we make smart systems that help us be more efficient in the space world? So we, are you interested in going to space? Absolutely. Send me out. Do you know, do you, do you know a person? <laughs> okay. So would you want to go to the moon, Mars, the internet? National Space Station. Um, if you had a choice, where would you want to go and why? I would like a one-way ticket to Mars because I would like to be one of the first people on the ground to set up the place, make it very, you know, natural, very habitable. And oh, there we go. There's Mars. And I guess just assisting people, that's kind of where my passion is, using technology to assist people and just to be able to be on the ground and create technology, I think, on Mars, because, you know, we need to create this stuff in situ, like it needs to be done on Mars. And, you know, knowing like what's available, what are the limitations, what are the constrictions, what are the restraints, I think that'll go a long way in just being able to experience the atmosphere and the beauty of Mars as well. You know, what I love about this is that you said, send me on that one way ticket. <laughs> <laughs> to Mars, and I'm like, wait, you don't want to come back? <laughs> no, I don't. I think, like, I think my life's work should be about, you know, creating something on Mars, creating a new world. I'm sign me up on that new world, Noah's Ark. Let's go. <laughs> you know, and that's really brave. And thinking about the early, you know, settlers and people who were willing to just go. I I love the story of, you know, how do you find Easter Island? How do you, you know, how do humans end up on Easter Island um, and that whole idea of that journey to get there? And, and that can be analogous to kind of getting to Mars. We know where Mars is, but they didn't know Easter Island existed. <laughs> Let's all That's pack right. it. When we look at the, his, the history of exploration, sometimes you just need to, you know, count your blessings and just go for it. And that's how we, that's how we propel humanity into like the next phase of evolution, I think. Mm -hmm, definitely. And so if you could build one thing, um, like right now in your brain, what is the one thing that you're like, I really want to 
build this because I think it'll help humanity or I think it'll help me on Mars? What would that be? The one thing that I could build for humanity, I would have to say, have you seen her? Yes. Maybe? I would say I would like to build her. Oh. I think, but <laughs> placing <laughs> design constraints around what an artificial intelligence could actually do i think that we would be able to assist the elderly you know now that you know our our longevity of life is you know exceeding our expectations every you know every few years so i think that we will need more assistance moving forward and you know helping mothers even with you know child care anything anywhere you need assistance and help i think that technology could fill a gap there you know, I, I love what you just said because that is what I want. I want the ultimate I want the ultimate personal assistant that like do you, do you me want to be it? It. I think that we need this. <laughs> I need it. I would say that I need it. And the reason why is the hardest thing for me is that I don't have the best memory. Um and so having a personal assistant to just remind me and I, and I, I set up my calendar and things like that. Uh, but I want something that's more intuitive, that understands me and my needs and, and can just assist me. And so obviously in the history of, of jobs and stuff, there are people who, if you have money, you can have that personal assistant, but yes. the everyday person can't afford that. But if we could build an artificial system, artificial intelligence system, that's smart enough and intuitive enough for me to be my personal assistant, oh, please. I'll be, let me test that for you. <laughs> well, I do have an Amazon Alexa. I know that she's going to get triggered around the back here somewhere. Oh, um, yeah. And I used to actually design skills in-house, like custom skills for the Amazon Alexa. And just being able to increase that bandwidth of what um, the AI or the machine learning can actually understand about you and know you and your needs and being able to ask questions like, hey, you set an alarm for 6 a.m. today. Would you like me to set one for every single day of the week? Like things like that. Is, I it really that. In a way. I love that. And it's funny because there's a sci-fi show um, and I'm blanking on it that I used to mm -hmm. love where it was a town where everything had AI and it was all automated. I don't know if this is familiar to you or anybody in the audience that's listening. Uh, and there was a sheriff who kind of like bumbled into the town and there's always something that goes wrong. But the house he lived in was amazing because it had a smart artificial intelligence system that was just so, you know, intuitive. And, and, and you're right. I would really like to see the future of space exploration look something like the movie Passengers with um, Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, yeah. where yeah. you know you have like that that nature mixed with that sterility, and then you've got you know it's a very human experience to be able to you know say okay I'm going to go swipe a barcode and get my food, and it's taking care of all my caloric needs, and someone's monitoring this. So I think. Um, I think there's a real future for AI and machine learning. And I think aboard the ISS, you know, they've, IBM have, have a, has, has an AI up there maybe still, I'm not sure, but I think it's called Simon, uh, based on the literature that I've read. <laughs> Hopefully that's still going and that's a, that would be a very interesting science experiment to follow. Oh, you know, all of that is amazing. And I, I think of that, that movie a lot because of, like you were saying, that melding of the, the nature and the technology, but I also that scene when she's in the, in the pool and yes. she, that oh. freaks me out though. <laughs> it's, just, fantastic. it's beautiful. I think that was the most artistic moment I've ever seen in, um, in, in all my sci-fi movie experiences. Oh yeah. That, that one I still think about, I'm like, Ooh, um, and so thinking about food and the funny thing is that, that the pet feeder, um, yeah. if you were going to go to Mars, what would you want to eat on Mars and why? Well, what do I want to eat on Mars? You know, when I get to Mars or when, you know, a group of us get to Mars and when humans eventually get to Mars, I think we're going to find that fresh food is going to be a rarity. And I think we're going to take for granted all the fresh food that we had here on Earth. So how do we make fresh food last longer or more sustainable? Because I know that whenever I buy uh, food from my fridge and you know, stick it in the fridge, it only lasts you a couple of weeks. And, you know, when we send fresh fruit and vegetables up to the astronauts, they've got to eat them. They've got to eat that first. 
it's going to go fast. <laughs> they do. And that's a real issue when we're talking about, you know, fresh and what is fresh and how yeah. we preserve fresh. Or is it possible to molecularly kind of like create something in, in, mm -hmm. in a form that we would call fresh, a new type of fresh? Um, and I don't know. That'd be interesting. I was actually having this conversation with uh, Ron Sparkman the other day about uh, live grown food and live grown meat and how, you know, tying in the ethics and sustainability factors of it, would you actually eat it? And what about you, Sian? What do you think? Would you would you meat grown in a lab? I would, especially if it, if it tastes good, I would. Um, but I think that it's interesting because that whole idea of nature and what nature produces and then thinking about the environment and the things that we may have done to the environment to offset uh, or contaminate the food that we're eating. And then the idea of, okay, well, if we can um, molecularly create our own meat and stuff like that, uh, how yeah. clean will it be of the things that we worry about now in our food versus the fact that it is genetically kind of engineered and manipulated how, you know, how will that affect us? And so these are really good questions. I agree with you. I think that, you know, when we look at hormones and preservatives and things like that, how can we free ourselves of those radicals and how do we um, improve human health like moving forward? And it really is like a holistic human health thing. Like how, how do, everything just ties into everything else, like the context that you live in. So your habitat, when we look at astronauts, how are we gonna be able to facilitate something that's a very, like very much a system it's a very systems engineering type thinking mm -hmm. in um, are we gonna how are we gonna take care of their you know caloric needs how are we gonna take care of you know their exercise and everything just ties into one another and even their moods and mm -hmm. assisting psychologically I think yeah I think I, I really see that um, you know lab grown food or I think there's a term for it I've completely forgotten do you know uh, it's not top of my head but uh, we have a question for you and it is do you think AI should be used to help lonely people maybe some older people living alone or do you think that's dangerous territory yes so I think that the place where AI is with right now and just moving forward and us being aware of what it's capable of I think it wouldn't be dangerous if the right people are designing it I believe that when we do create machine learning and AI and algorithms and things like that, they're a reflection of us, they're a reflection of humanity and then the people who created them. And it's always kind of kind of gives you a little bit of a God complex as well, I think, because you kind of realize that, you know, if we were in, made in the image of God and we create AI who's like, you know, which is in the image of us, then what's, what's, <laughs> that, if AI becomes dangerous, what's that saying about us as, as a humanity? You know, I really like that. And and you mentioned Alexa. And so you have an Alexa there. And yeah. and so I know oh, like, <laughs> yeah, spinning up, right? Listening in the background. And and so how do you interact right now with the AI technology that's out there? Mm -hmm. Um and how do you feel about it in general? Is it good enough right now, or do you see leaps and bounds coming in the near future? I think that when you're designing for emerging technologies, it's really important to observe over long periods of time um, how the user is interacting with their environment. I know that when I use my artificial intelligence, I use Siri, I use Alexa, it's often when my hands are busy. And when you're in the space environment, your hands are gonna be busy. Like our astronauts are always doing things. So when you know, if we look at space walks, when we look at um, when they're performing tasks, where AI could be, you know, particularly useful is when their hands are busy. And that's quite mm -hmm. often because they're always busy. <laughs> I love, you know, the, you're just making me think of things in ways where I'm just like, whoa. Um, and so where does VR technology and AR technology fit into all of this? I think VR and AR have a lot of potential uh, in terms of managing, I, I know they've done a lot of research around PTSD and a lot of psychological health factors and assisting um, like rehabilitation and areas where, you know, we can assist people who need psychological help. Now, when we look at astronauts and when we're going on a one way, one way to Mars or you know, maybe we'll go there and we'll come back, 
this is the very first time that humans are going to be moving in one direction so far away from the place where we've evolved for like billions of years to be a part of like we're a part of the system we need gravity for our bones we need everything like we need the air we need the atmosphere this is this is containing us and then when we when we go to mars we're kind of like on a we're going in like furthest away a human has ever been from earth so what kind of psychological effect is that going to have and i think we need to predict that and we need to manage that maybe we give them you know we, we try to like enable them to have some natural experiences using a vr headset yes. when we look at augmented reality one of the very first jobs that i had out of university was to design for the microsoft hololens now the hololens is augmented reality technology and you can actually see what's in front of you but also see additional information mm -hmm. and they're doing a lot of research with this around, you know, test pilots and fighter pilots and defense type mm -hmm. um, concepts. And I think moving forward, being able to even integrate that with how are we going to assist hands-free um, our astronauts who are busy with tasks. And I can, I can really see a lot of potential for both VR and AR. Oh, wow. That is so cool. The And, um, and so are you, are you in school right now as a researcher still? That's right. So I'm a PhD researcher. I'm about a year a year in, and in Australia we only do it for three years. So <laughs> I've got a few more years left, and like you, I'm hoping to get into an analog to do a little bit of research and maybe test some of this technology that I'm working on. And ergonomics mm -hmm. is a very good factor to make sure that it can like fit on humans. I'm working on wearable pieces, but also habitat pieces. A little bit, a bit about what we've been talking about and using machine learning as a tool to assist astronauts in the space environment. You know, well, I love that. I can help. Get, I've been in many analogs, so anything you want to ask me, just feel free. And those of you that are out there, if you have another question, just put it in the chat. I see uh, prohibiting hacking of AI is critical. It is even possible. Is it even possible to prevent? So when we think about that, that's the real danger, right? Because you talk about how it's a reflection of us, mm -hmm. uh, but that there are people who kind of might want to mess with that. Not very nice people. Uh, okay, so I think with AI, what we're looking at is if it was going to be part of a system that is accessible uh, in terms of being prone to hacking. Mm -hmm. If we made this a closed system and said, you can only access this within the realm of the ISS, for example, you wouldn't really be able to, unless ground control needed to have access to it, you need to have like an actual tether to the system itself. I think if we remove that tether completely and say this autonomous system, is only for the astronauts. Only the astronauts can use this and we contain it. And I think that would, you know, we can place barriers that can prevent hacking for sure. You know, because that's really interesting. And because especially if you're going to Mars, because you got to be autonomous. I mean, the, the communication delay yeah. alone is one of those yeah. things that you want to. Um, but then I think of Hal from like, you know, 2001. And do you, are you influenced by sci fi, sci fi movies and books at all? Actually, I used to be obsessed with sci-fi. I'm still obsessed with sci-fi. Any sci-fi movie that comes out, I have to be on it, especially if it has really futuristic concepts mm -hmm. because I consider myself a futurist and I really want to see all of this cool stuff become a reality. And we do, as you know, as a world population, have like a lot of other problems that we need to deal with that are more immediate. But definitely, I do think that solving, you know, a a few future problems could we can actually take that technology and reverse engineer it to solve a few problems that we have on earth right now you know i it, when i think about that when everything you're talking about i immediately think of the the holodeck of star trek and yeah. it, where you're in, and just imagining being able to do that and walk into a room and feel like you're there. And, and to some extent, when I put on the VR goggles and I go with like to the ISS, I just remember doing the shuttle one and I had the mm -hmm. goggles on and I went out the bay door and there was the earth and it was rotating. And I just was like, wow, wow. And like, I didn't move for 20 minutes. I just watched. I was like, wow, it's so cool. And, uh, and did you did you feel the overview effect that the overview effect that astronauts feel? I I definitely felt something um, because I even now when I was just talking about that, just I, I want to go back there because watching the Earth move and the details, I, I was mesmerized by that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I started to move a little bit and I was like, oh, I kind of feel a little sick now. <laughs> but that those moment, that moment just it lingers still in my brain. Yes. And I think that's a very human thing as well. It's a very human experience because, you know, what we've heard of from astronauts and the research that we've conducted on astronauts is that when they do see the earth from space, they're very attached to it. Like they're very much, you know, in love with it. They take hundreds and hundreds of photos and you see them all over Instagram. It's the same photo, but it's just in different places. And you realize that it seems like we actually really do love the earth. And it's just something that's, you know, ingrained in us. And as we do move towards Mars, like what effect is that really going to have on us? You know, I, I really am curious about all of that stuff. And again, the role technology is going to be playing, especially when we're looking at um, exponential kind of technology growth. And as a mm -hmm. futurist, trying to think about, well, where are we going to be in two years or five years or 10 years, which to some extent seems like it's, far away but it's not and you know i in a very short amount of time mm -hmm. been very connected to my yeah. my precious you know this is like lord of the rings yeah. <laughs> my phone my precious phone um and and so is there anything that is available now that makes you excited because you can see uh in two years or five years mm -hmm. we're gonna be like the, we're going to be captivated by this technology. This is it. Okay, so let's see. I know recently I was looking on Amazon for a, for a set of bathroom scales, and I was, you know, I was really, you know, happy to find that you can actually get bathroom scales now that actually connect up to your phone, and it keeps track of your weight and your goals and your muscle mass. And they do so many more things than what you have one of those. I do. I have one that I bought off of Amazon. <laughs> yes. And of course, you know, when you look at the future of human health, you realize that you can connect these things up to like your step count. You can connect this up to your other, you know, workouts, your um, your calorie intake even, because you know you've got my fitness pal that can like barcode scan things into your um into your diet, your food diary. So what would the the, the future of human health look like, and how is that going to help improve the quality of life for humans? And you know. I think no, continue. I'm just like blown yeah, away. Um, I think there's a lot of potential when it comes to um, improving human life. But then, what does that mean uh, for society as a whole? Like, are we going to live longer? And how do we facilitate that in terms of resources? Because we're going to need more resources, and we need to feed all these people who are going to be living longer. You know. So thinking about that, one, did you buy the scale? Did you pick out one that you liked? I did pick out one that I liked, but I haven't purchased it just yet because I'm just waiting to get settled. And you might see boxes behind me. I've actually just moved into a new place. Um, I have mine and I was doing really good tracking. And then now that we're in COVID and I feel like I've put on my COVID five, I've been a little more reluctant to <laughs> step on the scale. But it's funny how you're talking about um, connecting and all of the data that I'm getting and how that data, it, it inspires me to be better and to think about my health in ways that, you know, I'm not always conscious of. Um, and so, yeah. And so that's right. right. Oh, Sorry, go continue. No, <laughs> you go ahead, please. I was actually looking at like a larger scale of things in terms of the world and also in terms of like famine and how do we, you know, look at agriculture and we can, we use a lot of space technology every day to monitor these trends and. Especially and improve with the satellites. Yeah. Especially with the, you know, the technology and stuff. And then when you were talking, we're talking about big data, right? Mm -hmm. And, and how we able to analyze that and and the artificial intelligence that's needed to kind of like manage these big systems coming together. And the thing is, yeah, and sometimes you don't even need artificial intelligence. Sometimes we can create like little things within the technology in terms of, you know, taking data and making decisions in terms of it doesn't actually need to have like a mind of its own. It doesn't need to like even make any critical decisions. It's just able to say, okay, we can actually program in this data matches with this data and then this equals this. And then we can just say, okay, this is what you need to do when this happens. And I think it's called um, object status and feedback. I think it was, I'm taking myself back to university. Um, and it's just being able to give that feedback to you when, you know, it's seeing 
patterns in the data. And uh, that actually reminds me, so in Australia, we recently got a COVID-19 app that's been highly controversial because it requires, it does take data from you, but it actually only uses Bluetooth. And what happens is that you've got the app on your phone. And if another person has the app on their phone, if we come within 1.5 meters of one another, it exchanges details. And this is for faster contact tracing. Oh, and yeah. educating the public, I think there's definitely been a gap in how they've done this in terms of explaining how the technology actually works. And as a result, there hasn't been that much uptake. But the reality is, is that it's actually not like full on collecting data. It's just collecting your the details that you've already given it, which is your phone number, your name. And then when you come into close contact with someone else, it's just for faster contact tracing so that you can get treated faster. So I think there's things like that and just understanding technology and knowing that it's not AI. <laughs> You know, uh, and have you um, downloaded that app and used it yet? I have, I have, and it's fantastic, I have to say. I haven't had any, I haven't come into contact with anyone who has the app, but I think it's also about, you need to actually have downloaded the app and then giving them your phone number and your details. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing, they're not actually taking that directly from your phone. You're actually having to provide that to them. Mm -hmm. And that's like a very transparent um, process, I think. Oh yeah, definitely. We have another question that says, what would you like to use AR and VR to test in an analog? Um, what mm -hmm. experiment research would you design, for example? AR and VR to test in an analog and what yes. experiment research would I like to design, for example? I would be really curious. I'm not sure if we can um, replicate this in an analog, but what I would like to see is reversing the effects of the space environment or the human psyche. Um, the, I think I think one of the main things that I've been reading about is aggression and how the space environment. Uh, we've seen elevated um, instances of aggression over history, over historical space flights in the space environment. And how can we mitigate things like that? I'm not sure if AR and VR might be the best methods, but potentially if we're able to give astronauts more access to their friends and family and have that connectivity with Earth and visually being able to um, show them their friends and family, uh, I don't know, like maybe moving, maybe they go into a room and then you can like hug them. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> that would be really cool. You know, I, when I was living in the uh, Lunaris habitat, we had an AR system that we were testing <laughs> where, um, it was a meditation where you had the, I guess it was VR. So you put on the VR goggles and then there was a thing here where you blew into it and it measured your heart rate. I mean, your, I guess wow. your breath rate. And so yeah. as you breathe through this apparatus, there was a tree that I was watching in VR and the tree would like kind of breathe and grow with me. And it's like, if I could regulate my breath perfectly, then the tree blossomed. And so it was oh, wow. Yeah, it was it's a very really interesting. interesting. I, I do a lot of meditation myself. I do the Pasana meditation, and it's actually all breath focused. And mm -hmm. in terms of like theory behind it, is that your breath, you know, gives you life. And so you can actually, you know, if you're feeling angry, you notice that your breath becomes a lot faster. And just being aware of that, and then changing your uh, mindset. So I guess it's a little bit more about neuroplasticity as well. There's a lot of theory behind that. <laughs> that the scientific theory, I'd like to think. But um, yeah, meditation is a really good one. I could definitely see meditation being incorporated in the future into astronauts, you know, schedules moving forward. I would, I would love to see that. I think that's a necessity. Oh, I think so too. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, has VR used to help with motion sickness training? I, I know that the, that there are issues sometimes um, with people having motion sickness, um, just putting on the headset itself. Yeah. Yeah, so I think what I used to initially, it's been a while, it's been about five years since I worked with VR. There are specifications around how you design for VR. And when you do, in terms of helping with motion sickness, I would say that VR is the cause of motion sickness for a lot of people. I myself have different experiences with different um, actual uh, head mounted displays. So I think I favored the, um, uh, the HTC Vive over oh, yeah. the 
Yes, and uh, Facebook, don't kill me, don't kick me off because I've said this because they're a Facebook owned company. But I did at the time when we had the HTC Vive and the Oculus, I did find that the HTC Vive was able to, I think it was 45 frames per second or something like that. So you need to have like the specifications correct. And if you don't have that correct, then you're going to give your users um, motion sickness. And have they worked with motion sickness? I'm not too sure. I'll have to look that one up. So when we're thinking, um, uh, you know, you're in Australia. Um, hmm. and do you have a favorite food that you like to eat down there? Do I have a favorite food. You know, I love nachos. I love Mexican food. <laughs> I'm obsessed. I think I just I like spicy food, and so I think that's uh, that's what I I'm gonna go. With. Australia with spicy. I think it's because of my background. My background's Indian. I need a little bit of, uh, you know, hot sauce in my bag. <laughs> Carry it where, every, everywhere you go. And so, uh, well, that's one of my favorite foods, too. You got to have the crunch of the nacho, you know? And the texture. Um, but thinking about food in space and how technology can help us, uh, and we were talking about fresh, but the, what I see, though, is that comfort food and how we were brought up and so there'll be one thing with generations of people who are living on mars and they'll be used to kind of the culture of mars but if we were to send you to mars right now um from a psychological standpoint and food how difficult do you think it would be to to cope yes yeah, so i think that in terms of food i'd like to think that you know, if we're gonna be sending humans to Mars and then you've got like this long flight time and when we get there, we're probably gonna be there for a year and then we're on our way back. Um, we'd have to look at how do we, you know, when we're talking about nachos, we're just talking about like texture. How do you maintain that texture, that crunchy texture? How do we prevent it from going soggy? And I think there's an entire lab, um, both at ESA and at NASA, who work on you know trying to satisfy and keep the appetites um, wet of the astronauts because the last thing you want to do is make them lose their appetites and that's going to affect you know their their cognitive potential and their cognitive performance. And, but I think when I was reading um, when I was reading through a lot of my literature review initially for my PhD, um, keeping astronauts interested in food is it's a yeah. very big research area. That's there are people working on it all the time. <laughs> It, it really makes me wonder about where can, you know, technology play, what role will technology play in the psychology of that? Because maybe you can't have as many textures and stuff, um, but it, is there ways to augment or trick the brain and the senses into the fact that you're, you're, um, what you're eating is enjoyable in some I, way. I think meditation. I think meditation counts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have your VR headset on and you're eating it, and it may not be pizza, but because you've got this visual and maybe there's some smells that are coming out. And, and the smells, absolutely. Yeah. I think when I was going through my undergraduate degree of industrial, I think someone actually asked what, what was my education. It was industrial design and engineering, and it was industrial design, like, what is the function of smells? Because we do, you know, associate certain smells with certain foods. And, you know, that's what really gets our taste buds going. And how can we um, enhance that potentially when we do go to space where you've got all these other things going around? You've got the, the smell of space. You've got, um, you're, you know, you've got high safety levels potentially. You know, we're trying to manage a lot of different things, trying to make it habitable, trying to support life. And then we're trying to, you know, keep their appetites alive and going. And I could definitely see um, moving forward towards Mars, either we improve the equanimity of the, um, the colonizers, or maybe over time, as humans, um, we branch out into our own strand of Homo sapiens on Mars, maybe we just evolve to, um, to like the food that we can actually grow and have on Mars. And I'd like to see a future, you know, how would we come back? You know, if yeah. we were to colonize Mars and then we evolve, how do we come back and then readjust or is that just not a possibility? Well, you know, speaking, going into that, do you have a few more minutes? I know we're over our 30 minutes, but I have no, some I have questions for you. 
Because this gets me to thinking because I, you know, the artificial intelligence, the technology, um, and then taking humans and where humans are going to go in the future. And it really starts to get me thinking about cyborg and, and you know, um, the mixing of human and genetic material and stuff with the technology and the mm. AI. And you think of the matrix to some extent and being plugged in to get information. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you feel about, because a lot, there's an argument mm -hmm. that the only way we're really going to survive uh, in our solar system and beyond mm -hmm. is if we can be, evolve into some kind of hybrid and technology mm -hmm. might be a way to do that. What are your thoughts? I think that's definitely a probability. I feel like that might not happen in my, in my lifetime. I'd like to see it happen in my lifetime. And I do think that becoming, you know, using technology or kind of having like uh, temporary implants to help us accommodate to various atmospheres and things like that right. you know like avatar um, right. how you're able to, you know go into like another state like of you know a different body and you know inhabit that and then go about living your life on a different planet and then that brings me back to i think being uh, plugged into like a like a um like a subconscious or like a, like a what's it called um like a neural like network thing. shared consciousness yeah and i can't help but think how much more knowledge and experience as a as a species can we actually uh contain and use moving forward if we were all actually plugged into a shared consciousness the board <laughs> you're just like bringing up so many great sci-fi references and thinking about um those kinds of things but the the reality is they they're, they're potential there i mean people yeah. already have implants for hips and this and that and you know we're talking about potential nanotechnology and um uh, just uh, i can imagine what? One of the very first thoughts I actually had when we came into a pandemic, and you know, it's a global pandemic, it's a very big problem, it's affecting a lot of people, we've lost a lot of people, which is not great, was, you know, if we had this technology where we potentially might have had like nanochips and microchips in our wrists, and we were able to not share private information, like placing a barrier on that, and just assigning everyone with a unique identifier, for example, there are ways that we can design this in a way that we don't potentially give the government all this information about our whereabouts mm -hmm. and designing it in a way that we would have been able to track the movement of the virus itself mm -hmm. and how it spreads. And as a, you know, I feel like as a society, as, as humanity, we should be there already. Like we should really be pushing for this kind of stuff. And it really begins with design and how do we work well with engineering and development to create these technologies. You know, and I'm already wearing a data tracker, right? Mm -hmm. um, my, my watch, it does my heart rate, it does my steps, it does my movement. Yeah. But you mm -hmm. can imagine if it did stuff like temperature um, mm -hmm. and fever. And so, uh, and, and then getting into, like you said, some of the implants and stuff that can go in that can yeah. help monitor more like blood sugar levels and, uh, yeah. and how, how what we eat impacts our mood or you're not not necessarily our mood but like gluten sensitivity i now have gluten sensitivity and maybe mm -hmm. these little things can be measured on a constant basis just to inform me and make yep. me more aware of how my and to, give, and yeah. to give decision making capabilities back to you the user and it wouldn't have to be shared not necessarily unless you opted in for something um Sorry, I'm just gonna have a sip of water. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got my tea here, and so. <laughs> and I think that in terms of like nanobots, nanobot technology has been around for a really long time, and just being able to introduce that into your bloodstream, being able to do things with it, um, I, I would really like to see humanity begin to embrace technology and make it useful for you. The only person who has anything to benefit from technology is you and I. No, I, I totally agree with that. We've got a couple more questions. Um, uh -huh. It says, we need to solve the problem with crumbly food in space. Uh -huh. Sure, there's an easy fix. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that's interesting is when we talk about printed, 3D printed food or mm -hmm. um, the idea of like uh, the replicator of being able to go and push a button and say, I want this meal and <laughs> yeah. Uh, but when we're thinking about where we are now with food, 
Um, is there anything that you would or would need? Like, would you do the lab grown meats? I would do whatever it takes to get to space. <laughs> <laughs> that is the right answer right there. <laughs> Because I think when you get into that mindset and you're sort of like, okay, I'm about to do the most dangerous thing that any human has ever done. I think when you're in that headspace, you'll eat anything, like as long as it gets you there. <laughs> but are you are you a foodie? Like, is that something? Do you yeah. like to cook? I in I I like to cook a lot of healthy food. I think mm -hmm. for me, because I'm so conscious about like the human body and for me, you know, that ties in mm -hmm. with my research and enhancing cognitive performance, all that type of stuff is where my research does lie. And I think for me, putting the right kind of food into my body as fuel is what's going to keep me going. And that's what you know, keeps me looking so young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also looking to you, um, I'm actually, I really love desserts. I would have to say that's my vice. I love sticky egg pudding. I love desserts. Um, at the moment, I'm doing keto. I'm just trying out keto diet. Mm -hmm. And I made like these peanut butter balls with mm -hmm. um, sugar-free chocolate. And I realized this is just mainly butter. It's really high in calories, but I only have to do it for two weeks. So that's okay. Um, I think that also switching things up with your diet is really good. It's really good for you. It changes like the way that your body works and your metabolism. Like you really wanna keep challenging your body as much as you can, especially with food. You know, I was funny because what you were talking about, I wanted to make those. The, the I, call, I think they call them Buckeyes or something here in the States mm. where it's a butter ball and then they dip it in chocolate. So it's covered on the outside and yeah. um, totally delicious. Uh, it, so we have another one from, um, I'm amazed that there aren't implants to predict strokes or heart attacks yet. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're going down in that direction though. Yes, so there are many different ways I would say in terms of stroke and heart attacks. It really comes down to the design of technology and also like public uptake of technology is really important. If you think that you're gonna be at a high risk for stroke and heart attack because of family history, potentially you should start looking at technology that can assist with predicting these things. But also the technology itself, like how, what indicators is it using to predict this particular outcome? Like how do we go about, like every person's individual, everyone's, you know, different. And, you know, when we're, when we're monitoring health vitals, you know, we look at, we're easily able to do things like, you know, temp, core temperature, we're not able to easily do core temperature, but, you know, uh, core temperature is like the inside temperature and then you've got your ambient temperature. So often doctors will use, um, so that's the T, it's like a, it's like a thermometer that goes into your ear and it's yeah. able to use infrared. So we actually can't use infrared. We can't leave infrared on all the time, but we can trigger infrared. So when we look at things like AirPods, how can we design AirPods where we can just have inbuilt infrared you know sensors that are able to like switch on and check your core temperature really quickly and i've been seeing um whenever i go out to get a service now um during covid the pandemic they'll actually point like this little thing at your head <laughs> and they'll take your temperature before they let you into the shop so uh, you know just being able to take technology like that and then put it into one device that's able to like you're able to wear all the time um, right. One of the coolest, one of the coolest uh, technologies I saw recently was called the cat pin, and it was this pin that was being designed by researchers over at RMIT in Melbourne, and it was going to do word count, and it was supposed to assist the elderly with loneliness, with combating loneliness, because the recommended word count uh, is three thousand words per day. That's how much you're supposed to be speaking and interacting with someone else. So yeah, psychologically, there's a lot of potential. And even with, you know, stroke and, uh, was it heart attacks? Yeah. If you can find, like... No, I was just going to say, that's like Alexis. If you're talking to Alexis or Siri, you know, like yeah. you're by yourself, living by yourself. And you're like, so how are you doing today, Alexis? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think, I think... You know, that's a great idea. I'm going to have to start looking into that, Sian. Yeah. <laughs> we can start something. We could start our own company. <laughs> we could start making those. Because we're talking about loneliness and, and wanting company. And so I, I could imagine, and, and that goes back to that personal assistant or somebody or her, what we talked about at the beginning of wanting that person who you can have a conversation with and as they as you have that conversation and they get to know you 
they it, it, it becomes more organic and you feel connected um, but I gotta tell you what I really want is I want the cooking device now cooking devices are getting smarter I love my instant pot but I actually want a refrigerator kind of like system where I can just say you know what I feel like having blah 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 tonight and it will like go through my fridge and assemble <laughs> the but food. Can, don't you want a refrigerator that restocks itself? Oh, that too. Oh. <laughs> I love the idea of one that will, is smart enough to know when I'm low, order it and have it be delivered. Like the that thing that I cool. like. Yeah. I mean, I was also thinking when um, Elon Musk came out with the Boring Company and they had those tunnels, I couldn't help but think, wouldn't it be nice if these tunnels could take the trash out as well, like a vacuum? But then also, <laughs> if you had like another inward, you know, service, I would also like my fridge stocked up too, please. <laughs> I know, just the things that you want. And then, you know, having a system that would that makes meals for you, that are health and fresh meals. Um, and you could see something like that being incorporated to some extent i mean right now on the international space station and going to mars they're already prepared just add water and heat meals but if you can imagine yeah. in a bank of freeze-dried ingredients and they and the system was smart enough to pull what you want and then mix it together and hydrate it um with the right spices and stuff so that it's more on the fly and you can you could ha be creative with your cooking Absolutely. So are you envisioning something that you can just like push buttons on a little machine and it kind of like outputs yeah. what you need? Like a little machine. That yeah, would be pretty kind cool. Of like, kind of like that where I'm like, okay, it, I know what my space pantry is, but instead of the normal thing that I want here, I want to take, you know, it's like getting a pizza. And so, and but being able to change a pizza and being like, you know what, today I don't want mushrooms. I want um, artichokes and onions and this on it. And it, it will boop, 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 boop and put it all together and make it for you but i also think that a lot of people do like the experience of cooking itself and just having yeah. like a the room is and it's quite meditative like you know even cleaning after i actually quite like to clean after cooking because i find that it puts me into like this really mellow headspace where i don't have to think about anything and i'm like oh look everything's so sparkly clean um there's something about it maybe i'm a little ocd i don't know <laughs> you would be a perfect analog roommate then so i would live okay. in a house with you because you would you would clean up and i'm <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so a couple more questions we've got. Are you noticing any mental effects from with keto? How long have you been doing it now? I've been doing it for a week and that's 20 grams of carbs and under. And then I think the next stage of keto is where I go up to potentially 50 grams of carbs. So in, I don't know, like on day three, I really felt it. Like I really felt like hungry, like really hungry. But then I also felt like a little bit annoyed. Like I was bringing up things from like, you know, my friend said like a month ago, I was like, you said this this one time and <laughs> this is how it made me feel. <laughs> That's really funny. The, um, but I think that, yeah. Continue. It really does, like, it really impacts your moods. And I think, you know, moving forward with astronauts and the food that we give them and giving them enough time to consume it and making that an enjoyable experience is going to go a long way. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And that's, you know, that's a lot of the research that I've done is kind of thinking about food and mood and um, how do you feel. Um, and But not only that, what do you crave? And, and a lot of times when we're in these analog situations, the food is very limited. And so it's interesting to see how people talk about food and mm -hmm. how their cravings change during the analog mission um, and what they're looking forward to eating when they get out. Uh huh. That's very interesting. That's very cool. Um, well, hold on. Do we have any more questions? I just wanted to check really quickly because. What is your goal? I, I really like this question by Lisa. What exactly is your study and what is your goal with your degree? So Lisa, what I'm creating is an autonomous life support system for astronauts. So all the things that we've been talking about, um, I'm potentially focusing on, I uh, will be put, potentially focusing on more around the fatigue that you experience when you first entered an altered gravity environment. So they're the high risk phases of emission. And this is where you uh, first enter either microgravity or when you first enter the altered gravity on Mars. And what will happen is that your body needs time to adapt. And during this time, you're gonna need assistance 
using technology to help you, you know, set up a habitat, um, even things like, you know, social interactions, everything is very, you know, uh, I think Paolo Nesboli, who's an astronaut, said that when you first enter microgravity, it's like your IQ has been divided by three and that's what you're operating at. So uh, being able to assist astronauts when their, um, their, you know, intuition is down, when, you know, it's a high risk phase and just being able to keep them alive. We need to keep them alive, people. It's really important. And where do I see myself going? Um, potentially, there's a collaboration with NASA happening um, soon. In fact, I think we were discussing it over with the Fatigue Research Lab. So hopefully that will go through whenever I can come over to America, which will probably be in about a year. And in terms of where I'd like to go, you know, I really see myself maybe working for the United Nations in a capacity in the in the far future, um, UN Corpus, which is the Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. And uh, as we move towards Mars, we're really going to have to, you know, we need people, people. Like, we need people, people who can understand other people. And we're going to have to focus on, like, you know, regulating, you know, things like ownership of, you know, resources, the moon belongs to everyone so we need to like look at okay how do we how do we prevent corporations from making a lot of money off this kind of stuff like what do we allow on mars how do we assist the astronauts in becoming like independent um if that's what they want to do how do we you know support them you know there's no money on mars <laughs> so <laughs> it's 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 what it's what have you got like how do we trade how do we like as a civilization what can we see um martians the future martians um, being, you know, it's it, everything. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I just have, you know, we were talking about sci-fi and movies and things like that. Um, is there anything that you're watching now that you really love that's kind of inspiring you? Oh, uh, let's see. I, I would have to say, oh, What's a good sci-fi show that I've been watching? There's a few. I usually just watch a lot of Netflix and I tend to you know, gravitate towards sci-fi. I really like Stranger Things because I'm a big Stephen King fan. And, you know, um, I think that, oh, I really like that, that, that neon, like the neon aspect of like the 80s and bring that all into um, maybe like other <laughs> My childhood. So I yeah. know. Well, I'm, I'm a 90s kid, so for me, it's kind of like it's it's all new, it's all retro. I love colors and florals, and uh, even with spacesuits and things like that, I really want to see more innovation, and um, I'd like to see more color. <laughs> I can see why they're white, but I'd like to see more color. <laughs> I definitely would like to see more color too. Now, have you seen The Expanse? I have seen The Expanse, but I'm, I think I'm only on season one or two. I'm, you know, I tend to fall behind a little bit. I'm not sure why that is. There's a lot of talking and it's it's still very interesting. Like it's very interesting in terms of like the politics behind it. And you know, you've got the corporations and this is pretty much like what I was just saying when we do move towards Mars and, you know, colonizing other planets and, you know, potentially other systems, how do we go about managing politics and the things that make us human? Because we're not going to stop being you know those those human urges to colonize they're the good side, like you know, good and bad um mm -hmm. but the exploration aspect of it and maintaining our curiosity but also you know remembering that you know we've you know we've we've gone from earth and now we're expanding like what values and qualities are we going to take with us what's going to be the future what are we going to teach our you know great-grandchildren what are we going to leave behind as a legacy it's important it is it really is important and oh i'm gonna I'm going to think of what that television show is and send it to you because the one that I watched, I think it's right up your alley um, I, it, because of the artificial intelligence and it's the smart town. The town itself is filled with nothing but like Einstein people and and wow. they're, it's, and it's and then this one normal guy kind of comes in and becomes the sheriff of the town and there's always like experiments and stuff going on and he always has to kind of solve it but again it's the technology that i love watching shows like that because it inspires me to think differently about the future absolutely and that's the same with me like when i was watching passengers and i think you brought up the swimming pool example earlier you know being able to uh, develop artificial gravity like i really want to see a future where we have that because it's going to solve a lot of our problems when we go to space, when we go to mars and when we go beyond 
you know, we could we could go tomorrow if we had artificial gravity. It's going to solve a lot of our problems. Oh, I love that. I, I just the thought of even with food and, and what that would mean for growing things and stuff and some of the challenges there. And so I, I think that's great. Um, Anu, can you share with the people who have been listening and thank you for staying on longer no, um, how to follow you? Yeah. And, and oh, just oh, kind of. Sure. I'm Mars Anu on Twitter and Instagram. And I am putting up a website soon. I'll put a little bit more space communication type videos up on there. Um, but I think with Twitter is probably the best way to follow me. And I tend to like go off topic a little bit. I like my um, space with a dash of politics. So I do because it's really important. And you might know this in terms of like how we get funding and what's actually happening in the world and how we can, you know, you know, learn lessons and even, you know, make create technology and how space can help what's happening in the world right now. So I think there's, there's a lot of crossover. <laughs> oh, you know, and it is, and I'm excited to see um, the things that you're going to be developing in the future. And I would love to go in, into an analog mission with you someday. So I think we have- Absolutely, let's definitely work on that. Let's, let's do yeah. that. <laughs> oh, for sure. And those of you that tuned in today, thank you for, um, tuning in on this unusual hour because of, of you being in Australia. <laughs> and um, this, today's recipe card is this one. And so I'll pick one lucky person who tuned in and I'll, and you will receive today's Louisiana catfish. It's blackened catfish. <laughs> so, um, and th thanks again for, for joining us today. And it thank looks like you're having me. And thank yeah. you everyone who joined us. And thank you for the questions. I love questions. Feel free to tweet questions at me. I love answering them. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye.